Melissa, Laura, Leah. We got almost everyone back. Okay, now it's working. I something happened with that machine. Yay. Oh, that's the skeleton. Okay. Okay, I think we're all back. Yay, we're missing someone today, but everyone who's here before is. Okay, so this computer is working fine. Ours installed fine on it. But I did want to look at that plot, box plot because there were some funky looking box plots. Yay, it knit. Lovely. Okay, yeah, this box plot, the economics majors. So the, remember, what's the deal with those dots out there? The dots are if you have observations that are more than one and a half stand interquartile ranges away from the box. And so in the economics major, there's so few of them and they all scored a seven, eight, or a nine. So seven and nine are the min and max, everybody else is an eight. Well, if everyone's an eight, then the lower quartile and the upper quartile are eight. So the box is going from eight to eight. So the interquartile range is zero. So th that's why there's no whiskers going out. It's because the box is so skinny. Everything that's not the box, which is this line, is a dot. And that's why in this first box plot, you see the median and the third quartile are the same. So they're on top of each other, basically. And this is because of two things. One, they're relatively small subgroups. And number two, they're only whole numbers. And so there's a lot of overlapping scores or scores that are the same number exactly. Because they had to be a whole number. Okay. But we got Laura had the, the quotes and that's, so you have, did you have like that quoted? Or yeah, see. yeah. So I just did what I did with full sample to all the variables. So it just- I made your F like that. Mm -hmm. So you'll got one. Well, I did that to major F and to stack quiz. So oh, yeah. like, doing bowl, you yeah. get one. <laughs> because this is just one value and this is one value. So here right. we get stat quiz is just the text stat quiz, not the actual variable of stat quiz scores. Yeah. So if you most things in the tidyverse if you're calling a variable that already exists in your data set, you don't quote the variable name. Okay. Now that is not 100% consistent because the packages were being developed independently across many years. But for the most part, variable names where the variable is already in the data set, you don't quote it. And when you put things in quotes, it's just text that doesn't refer to anything. It's just text. Yeah. So that's on this one, we said, X equals full sample, so that just labels it. It doesn't do right. anything with the full sample. Right. Okay. How are you guys feeling about R now after four chapters compared to how you were on day one? <laughs> Is it coming a little bit? Are you gonna, are we, we doggy paddling a little bit now? Yeah, Melissa, your computer had some fun yesterday. 
Okay. Any other chapter one, two, three, four things? Okay. Well, today we're supposed to cover chapters five and six. Has anyone had a chance to read them? I pushed the summaries off till Friday. So you've got two more days to do the discussion summary thing because I didn't want anyone too overwhelmed with the exam going on. Okay, so let's go to some slides. So I'm gonna go to our Stat Foundation website and down to the slides for chapter five and six are HTML. Okay, so five is on hypothesis testing and six kind of is two. In chapter five, we're gonna deal with one sample Z test. And in chapter six, we're gonna add the T test or the T distribution. Both of these chapters are gonna be with one sample. Next week, when we come back, we're gonna do two sample, I believe. Okay, so let's go into chapter five. So, um, a lot of research, we want to know, is there a difference? So a lot of statistical tests deal with, is there a difference? And if we want to know if something makes a difference, we need to compare it to another group. So a lot, two group research is very, very common. We are going to do more than two groups, but right now we're going to stay simple. We have two groups. And a lot of times it's a treatment and a control group. Later on, we'll do pre-post tests. Um, that's a repeated factor or paired or matched pairs t-test. But for right now, we're just having two groups and we're comparing them in regards to one variable. So the key here is two groups exactly on one measurement. So we're going to compare the age of two groups. We're going to compare the depression scores in two groups. We're going to compare one characteristic at a time. And this is, um, we're going to use a Z test and then work into a T test. If you have more than two groups, you have to move from a Z or T test to an ANOVA. And then chi-squared tests are what we're gonna cover in the last lecture in chapters 19, mostly 20. So this kind of research question is, do the groups differ? Are the averages about the same or are the averages a little enough different that there's something going on. There are other types of research questions. This is the other flavor of research questions, which instead of saying, are these groups different? We want to know, are these two variables related to each other? So we might want to know, are those that get therapy going to have lower depression scores than those that don't? Does teaching with computers versus just a textbook result in different scores at the end of the lesson period? So we might want to compare two groups. The relationship might be, does the reading score, is that predictive of a science score? Is the amount of community engagement related to depression? So the those two kinds of research questions can both be addressed quantitatively, but they require different methodology. The t-test, ANOVA, and chi-squared are comparing groups. Correlation and a regression are more when we're comparing variables that may be in one group or multiple groups, but we want to know, are is there a relationship or an association between variables? Now, that said, ANOVA can be thought of, or it's the same mathematically, mathematical underpinnings as regression. But right now, we're going to kind of make that distinction in our mind. Are we looking at comparing groups or seeing if there's a relationship between variables? So inferential statistics, I think we said before, we usually want to know about a whole population. But because of limitations in time, budget, energy, and possibility, we cannot measure the whole population. So instead, we go out and gather data on a smaller subset, a sample. And then we say, based on the sample statistic, we're going to make a claim or a generalization to the population parameter. That is inference. So we rely on raw data on a sample 
to make a claim or state evidence about a hypothesis regarding the entire population. That inference is, yes, it makes a difference. Um, we also can talk about how accurate we are about an estimate, um, but that's inference. Descriptive statistics are usually limited to just describing the data. So thus far we used like table F and table one to come up with means and standard deviations, counts and percentages, those kinds of things, the box plots and the histograms that we've made so far, all of those things, descriptive statistics, are sometimes labeled as exploratory data analysis. And it's not trivial, it's very important to do first. Always plot your data first. Uh, your first table in your manuscript is almost always gonna be table one descriptives on your variables, descriptive of your sample. Descriptive statistics are very important, but we wanna go one step beyond that with our quantitative methodology and make some claim about the population. So we need to be able to say what we have in our sample, but also what evidence that gives us about the entire population. So when the way that we do that with the standard statistical methodology is with a hypothesis test and or a parameter estimate. So a hypothesis test is where we say, yes, we have evidence, or no, we don't have evidence. And we use kind of a measurement of our evidence is a p-value. That is our measuring stick for saying if we do or don't have evidence that a difference we're observing or an association we're observing is more than we would expect just due to random chance. Parameter estimates, or sometimes it's called point estimates, is when we say what we think its value is. Like how, if we think that there are, is evidence that two groups are different, the point estimate or the parameter estimate is how different are they? What's the size of that difference? A p-value might tell us that yes, there's an association, but then how strong is the so correlation, that how strong is the association, that's a parameter estimate or a point estimate. And we're never 100% sure. Anytime you take a sample, you might have evidence about the whole population, but we don't have 100% accuracy. So we're gonna have a, a margin of error there, and that's the idea of a confidence interval. We have a best guess, plus or minus a margin of error, that range is our confidence interval. So that's kind of the big picture of what we're gonna do with the rest of the class. We're gonna do some hypothesis testing, and we're gonna do some parameter estimation with confidence intervals. So the whole idea is when you take a sample, you get information about your population, but it's never going to be perfect. If you take a different sample, you would get slightly different numbers. And so we are going to base our decisions on what happens if, theoretically, you were to take lots of samples. So we kind of work backwards in these chapters, we say, if we knew what the population was, if we could know that, we're gonna like play God, we know the population and say, what would all the samples look like? All possible samples. But in the real world, do we do all possible samples? Do we know about the whole population? No, in the real world, we only get to look at just our sample. It's the whole population that we want to know about. So we kind of are going from two different directions in these chapters. So this brings up a, an important idea. An idea is causality. So a lot of times we want to establish causality. This method causes students to learn better. This drug helps cure COVID-19. We want causality. But in order to, to establish causality, we cannot just observe a correlation or observe evidence. So a really good example of this is smoking. So Ronald Fisher helped develop hypothesis testing. He's one of our, he's one of the fathers of modern day statistics. So Ronald Fisher, he was a brilliant man, but he had a huge ego and he had some really questionable ideas. He believed in eugenics and um, just, you know, I don't know that we would have been friends, but he was brilliant. 
about statistics. Um, and he smoked a pipe. And he did not believe that smoking had health problems, like it was starting to be talked about at the time. Um, and so that brings the idea, how do we know that smoking causes, say, lung cancer? How do we know that that causality exists? Has there ever been a randomized study where we randomized people and had them smoke for five years or 10 years and randomized other people and said, you're not allowed to smoke for five or 10 or 20 years? Has that ever been done? No, why not? A little unethical. Just a little hair, just a little unethical. Um, so the gold standard methodology to prove causality is a randomized controlled experiment where you have a placebo group and you have a treatment group and every all your participants are randomly assigned and those participants are blind they don't know which group they're in and the people doing the measurements are also blind that's a double blind study so you have probably heard about this yes take your head yes if you have in your methodology class it's the gold standard but it is unfeasible in most of your disciplines to do a fully randomized controlled double blind study. A lot of times, the, all we can do is gather observational data or the quasi experimental data, right? So how do we go about gathering evidence of causality if we can't randomize? There's some bullet points on here that are the things that we need to show in order to help provide a mountain of evidence. So one study the truth does not make. We need to have a mountain of evidence. Needs to be, so these are, this is like the checklist. And, and this is what people did for smoking, and this is what you're gonna do in your discipline, is help add to the mountain of evidence in your discipline. We need to have a credible reason or pathway, theoretically, why the causality would exist. Um, with smoking, what is the pathway biological that by which smoking could lead to lung cancer? How is it, what would be the biological reason or, or pathway where someone smokes and then they, down the road they get lung cancer? What's the biological pathway? Lungs? Yeah, Kelly, what, what happens in the lungs? What's smoking in lungs? How would that happen? Uh, because, well, it's what's the literal pathway where the smoke goes. And so it's, it's what causes, I mean, the smoke would cause the lung cancer. Am I getting close? Yeah, but how? What is it about smoking that causes, like, the reasoning behind that? What is it in smoking, cigarette smoking? Oh, oh like the... Um, like the nicotine or the tobacco or the actual smoke itself or all the chemicals? It's the chemicals specifically like the tar that builds up in the lungs. So biologically, there's a rationale, a pathway that when you smoke cigarettes, these hot chemicals come in, including the tar, it coats the inside of the lungs. That's, you know, we have a pathway that makes sense why there might be a link there. We also need to see a strength of an association. So among those people that choose to smoke, we see a higher incident rate of lung cancer. And among, in places of the world where there's lower smoking, there's less can lung cancer in the lungs. So there's a strength of an association. We also need to know if it will establish a consistency with past research findings if they've been done. A big one is temporality. Does the smoking come first and then is it followed by the lung cancer? That there is a temporality in effect. So this is um, why longitudinal studies are very important, even if they're observational. If you do cross-sectional, it's a little harder to establish temporality, what came first. Like if you go measure elementary kids, and you measure their vocabulary and their um, stress level and 
how do you, and you want to show a mediation relationship, how do you prove that A came first and then B came second and then C came third? You need to have some way to establish temporality, especially in cause and effect relationships, which mediation is. You need to be able to establish a dose response relationship. People who only smoke a couple cigarettes a week, do they have a little bit of an increased lung cancer, but the person that's smoking a pack a day have a higher chance of lung cancer? Not just is there an association, but the amount or dose of the exposure, is that connected to a greater increase or greater severity of the outcome? And is it specific? And then what we hope is can you have some prevention? If someone's smoking, but then they stop, do you inhibit the risk? All of those things are ways that you can add evidence towards establishing a causal relationship, even when you can't do a controlled randomized study. How long did it take for people to really be convinced that smoking was damaging to health? Was it a year? Was it 10 years? It was close. Wasn't it about 50 years? It was close to 50 years. I mean, I, when I was a kid, cause I'm older than you, Sarah, but like not much. <laughs> when I was a kid, like I, I worked at a, at a, at a, um, drive, like a, I don't know, like you could drive up and order and get your cigarette through a drive through grocery store in the small town. And I remember seeing that it was like, Surgeon General's warrant, it's probably illegal for me to even sell them, but it, it, it's okay. Um, but because I was younger than 19, but it just said the Surgeon General's warning that is it was hazardous to your health. And then later on, it changed to like specific things with the cigarette packages. It's yeah, kind of I, interesting. I remember in magazines, they'd have the cartoons advertising cig cigarette smoking. These kinds of causal relationships take a long time to establish. And hey, Sarah, so, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but I think Sam just sent me a text. Oh, oh, he needs to be let in. Off. Yeah. Sorry it's to interrupt. Added. Yeah. I had it up here, but I was too caught up in having such a fun conversation. Welcome back, Sam. <laughs> so, um, just, I want to make sure that you, this is in your forefront of your brain. As you guys are writing your proposals for your thesis and your dissertation, you're going to probably want to make some statement about causality in the, whatever it is you're studying. But we need to be realistic that one study is not going to be able to clearly establish causality, especially the budget and time restraints you're going to be um, working with for a thesis or dissertation. Is everyone working on a dissertation in here, right? You guys are all in the PhD program of one type or another? Yeah, so we want to establish causality, but first we need to look at all these bullet points. So it's important to work on any one of these. And the best dissertation is a done dissertation. Your job with your dissertation is partially an exercise to show your, prove to your committee that you can do research and to fulfill the requirements. And hopefully it's to also add a drop in the bucket for your discipline. And that even if you believe there is a causal relationship, even adding to the evidence to any of these bullet points is helpful. And one of the most common things I have to do in consultation with grad students is rein them back in that you're not trying to do your life's work. And if you do bite off more than you can chew and you can't deliver oh on your gosh. promises, your committee will uh, hold you to it and you'll never graduate. So um, just there are other ways to add to the evidence of a causal relationship besides straight to causality. So even if you can prove temporality, that when this comes first, this comes second, that's important and that you need to think about that when you're designing your experiment or your observational study and how you're gonna gather data. Oh, I gotta click on the right thing. Okay. 
even then, even with this mountain of evidence, it's still a judgment call to combine the results. Um, let me bring up another topic that's a little bit conversation. Conver can't even spit out the words today. Um, vaccines and autism. Is there a causal connection between vaccinations in young children and autism being developed? I see some head shaking. The answer has been definitively no. Do you, do you guys know how many studies have shown a link? One. And do you know what the sample size for that one was? Sample no. size six. And do you know who the six kids were that were supposedly autistic? They were kids that the researcher personally knew and at least half of them were later shown to be non-autistic. The main author, all the co-authors removed their names from the paper. The main PI lost his medical license. There it's sample size six. How many studies have since then been published that have shown no connection? Hundreds often with sample sizes of 10 to 60,000 children that are random and representative. And yet, what belief still persists, especially among affluent, educated people in say Washington or California. Yeah, so, you know, as a professional in your field, <laughs> Gathering data is important, but still, you know, you can bang someone over the head and it's still a judgment call. And so that's why we really want to create this mountain of evidence. And, and I think with the autist, autism and vaccines, they really have now created a mountain of evidence. So that's what you want to be doing in your fields. Okay, so the main measuring tool for statistical evidence is the p-value. And when we use a p-value, whether it's for a z-score, a t-score, an f-score, a chi-squared, any of these statistics that we learn, a smaller p-value means results are more unlikely or unusual to be caused by random chance. So our small p-values are evidence that there is likely something else going on. We're always going to state a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. And almost without exception, our null hypothesis is nothing going on, nothing going on. And our p-value is, hmm, how likely is our data that we gather from a sample, how likely is it that we get that extreme of data if nothing's really going on? Okay, so they, these are the six steps of a hypothesis test. And we are going to do hypothesis tests in every single chapter for the rest of this book. The whole, what, five weeks that are left. Five weeks from today, we'll be done. We can hang in there. Okay, so step number one, we're going to write our hypotheses, our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. Step two, we're going to select which test we're going to do and the significance level. This also involves deciding if we want one tail or two tail test and what our alpha or significance level is going to be. So some notes for, for those. Our alpha level, what alpha are we gonna use? You guys have had some stats before, some experience with stats. What do we use for alpha? 0 0.05. 0 0.05, yay! Alpha 0 0.05, if our p-value is less than 0 0.05, we have evidence. Where'd 0 0.05 come from? Kimberly, do you tell the story to your stat students? I think you're muted. It, the one where he'd like roll over in his grave if he knew that we were using that as a cutoff? <laughs> yeah, so Fisher, <laughs> You know, he always would state your significance, your p-value is the, what do we say on the last slide? It's the probability, 
how, it measures how unlikely your results would be if the null hypothesis was true. It's how unlikely those results would be, the chance of observing them. And people would say, well, how small is small enough to have evidence? And he said, well, what's the risk of being wrong? Now, if I am doing a phase one clinical trial for COVID, right? They're going on all over the place right now. If I have a hundred drugs that I'm testing to see if they work, because they worked on other things, um, how, what, what do I want my false positive, false negative results to be? Would I rather miss pick, figuring out which ones work? That's a, like saying having a false positive would be, I say, ooh, this drug looks good, let's keep testing it, when it really isn't. And a false negative would be the drug that works, we exclude early on. What's worse? Are the, those risks of the same in a phase one clinical trial when we're just kind of screening through a whole bunch of drugs? What's worse, to miss the truth or to pick up a false positive on accident? I would guess to pick up the false, but- Is it okay to, to continue with too many drugs? Yeah. It's okay to take too many. We don't wanna miss the truth though. Right. If there is one drug out there that helps, we wanna make sure we get it. We're okay if we pick up too many. Versus what if we're going to implement a national education policy? What's the risk of being wrong there? And we probably won't do any research at all. We'll just buy it from the textbook company. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the situation, there is money, time, and energy, and different risks of being wrong. And Fisher was very, very clear that there is no one p-value that fits every one alpha level to cut p-values off as being significant and non-significant. There's no one rule that fits every situation. How strong do you want your evidence? What do you want your false negative, false positive rates to be set at? Those are going to be different criteria in every situation. But some people kept bugging Fisher. Well, well, how small is small enough to be unlikely? Because he's like, you want your, if your p-value is small, then that means it's unlikely to observe those results by chance if nothing's going on. And they bugged him and bugged him and bugged him. And finally, he said something like, well, one in 20 is probably good enough in a lot of situations. One divided by 20 is 0.05. And thus, the law was written in stone. And if there's nothing else that you remember from today, I hope it is that alpha 0.05, declaring p-values to be statistically significant if they're smaller than 0.05, is not a hard rule. It is a fuzzy line that's been drawn in the sand and people march around it and say, this is the law, and it is not. And um, statisticians have been saying this forever, and ever and ever since starting with Fisher. Um, but a lot of researchers forget that. And then we have the problems like in social sciences right now, we say that there is a um, repli replicability crisis. And one of the things is relying on p-values less than 0.05 too strictly. And so we will read an article, unless I've cut it out because of time this summer, about this um, task force. And one of the things it did was look at p-value reliance. But alpha 0.05 is generally what we're gonna use. So on the homework, at least, we're gonna use an alpha 0.05 as our significance level, unless it says otherwise, okay? So for the homework in the book, and on Canvas, if it doesn't say otherwise, we're going to cut our p-values, significant, not significant, at alpha 0.05. The other distinction here is, are we going to do a one-tailed or a two-tailed test? Unless you have good evidence and reasoning why, we always want to do two-tailed tests when we're doing z-tests and t-tests. Always. We're going to do two-tailed unless we have clear reasoning to do otherwise. And we'll see the, what happens when you do a one-tail test in a little bit versus a two. So, this is, so you're going to go through this whole process. This is the scientific um, method, by the way. This is what made me fall in love with statistics. 
we're going to, based on our experience, develop a set of hypotheses. We're going to decide what tests we're going to do and what our criteria are. Then we're going to go get our data, hopefully a random sample, collect our data, do the measurements. Based on our sample statistic, we're going to say, does it fall outside the root? Does that fall in the rejection region or is the p-value less than alpha by using a test statistic? And today we're going to do z and t and later on we're going to do f and chi squared. And then the final step is crucial. We're going to write our conclusion. In this class, we're going to do alpha 0.05 unless it says otherwise. We're going to do two tails unless it says otherwise because you better have some good reasoning. And we're going to use when we write our conclusion, it needs to be in context. You will never, hopefully, read an article that says, reject the null hypothesis. That is not a conclusion. You're, you can say that to yourself or even write it down, but that is not the conclusion. The conclusion is, there appears to be evidence that this new teaching method leads to higher math scores. There is not evidence that males score higher than females on the depression score. Your conclusion must be in context about the people and the thing that you're researching. Okay? We will practice this. And we're gonna do APA style conclusions most of the time too. We'll work on that. Okay, so in this yellow box, the definition of a p-value. This is the most terrible English, if I've ever seen one, English sentence. And try as you may to, to make it simpler, you need every single one of these words. A p-value is the probability of observing a test statistic as extreme or more extreme if the null hypothesis is true. Hypothesis testing always is a function under the assumption of the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is almost always nothing's going on. So if we assume nothing's going on, how extreme is our data? And it's not just how extreme is that value, but it's how extreme is that value or more, what's the probability of that value or more extreme? So this is why we practice with our Z table looking at the area beyond Z, out in the tail. The p-value is the tail. It's that extreme or more extreme. I would um, write that definition of a p-value somewhere where you can see it on your notebook, on your mirror, and get used to saying it. Assuming the null hypothesis is true, what's the probability of observing a test statistic, i.e. what's the data, as extreme or more extreme? Okay. Anyone have any questions about hypothesis testing? I know you've done it in a class at one point in your life. You had to do, I think, one on the pretest. So what's the difference between the alpha level and p-value? Okay, that's a good question. The p-value is that probability of being that extreme or of observing data that extreme or more extreme. It's the actual probability. So it will be a decimal number. P-values are always between zero and one, so they're always gonna be a decimal number. The p-value is for our data. The alpha is like our set criteria that we set before we do the test. So okay. before we do our test, we're gonna, we might say, we are going to set our significance level, kind of like our benchmark, before we do the test. And we're gonna say our benchmark's 0.05. And then when we do our p-value, we're gonna see, is our p-value smaller than that or not? Alpha okay. is the benchmark, p-value is where our data fall. Okay, so alpha is the criteria values the outcome of the study is what the data shows yeah will you just say that one more time okay so the alpha is our criteria for how small we are going to say we need our alpha to be in order to declare statistical significance a 
lot of languaging. We better do an example for sure. And how is that different from p-value? p-value is actually the measured probability of our data. So the one is the level we've set, the other is where did it fall? Where, we, where did it fall? And we're going to compare that and say, is our p-value smaller than alpha or bigger than alpha? Alpha is that like benchmark, that criteria, that line in the sand we draw. Okay, when we're stating our hypotheses, we're always going to have a null hypothesis. And null is spelled N-U-L-L, -L, but when we write it, a lot of times we'll do H with a little zero, a little subscript zero. Zero is like if nothing else is happening, zero. Baseline, like null, nothing. Null means nothing. So if nothing's going on, then our two groups should be the same. If the teaching method doesn't matter, the old method and the new method groups should be the same. If family history has nothing to do with depression, those with family history and without, their depression level should be the same. There will be no difference. Now, when we actually go gather data, are they gonna be identical exactly to 10 decimal places in the average? No, there's gonna be a little discrepancy. So the job of the statistical set test is to say, are they close enough, they're pretty much the same, or are they so different that we got to believe there's something else going on? So the null hypothesis is always going to be nothing going on. So if we're doing two group, group means, our null hypothesis is the two groups have the same mean. Now I want you to look at this null hypothesis. What symbol are we using for mean? Mu. Mu refers to what? The sample or the whole population? The whole population. The population parameter. We always make our hypotheses about the whole population because that's what we want to make our claim. We want to make the claim if we were to implement this teaching method to the whole United States, all second graders, or if everyone was exposed to a family history. We always want to make our claim, our hypothesis about the whole population. Those mu's we never can really get unless we're in a textbook problem, but we're making a claim about them. So our null hypothesis is the claim that the two mu's, the two population averages, are identical with an equal sign. Our alternative hypothesis is also sometimes called our research hypothesis. This is the thing that we're usually thinking is going on. It's not nothing's going on, it's something's going on. And we can write this or propose this in at least three ways for two means. Instead of being equal, we can say that they are not equal, or we can propose that one group's higher than the other, or in the reverse direction. So the most common way to write our alternative hypothesis, and we can do this with an H with a little one, or H with a subscript A, depending on the textbook, but that alternative hypothesis is that the two mu's are not equal. That is the two-tailed alternative, because it could be that the first group's higher, or maybe the second group's higher. It allows for both options. There's a little or here, because that's not the only way to write an alternative hypothesis. A research hypothesis could be that the two groups are not equal, It could, or we could write it that the first group is a bit higher average than the second, or the first group is lower than the second group. Sam? If we write our alternative hypothesis that way, choosing a direction, do we do a one-tailed test then? Yes. If you okay. use one of those alligator symbols, the greater than or less than, that is doing a one-tailed test. Exactly. If we write it with the not equal sign, that's doing a two-tailed test. 
Good distinction, Sam, thanks. See, lots of writing going on. Okay. All right. The way we proceed with our hypothesis test is much the same way we do in the court system in the United States. And if you are charged with something, you're sued or a criminal charge and you're taken to court, what do we say? You are innocent until proven guilty. We do the same thing with a hypothesis test. Innocence means nothing's going on. So our null hypothesis is nothing going on. The method, new method of teaching does nothing more than the old one. Family exposures does nothing more than no family exposure. There's nothing going on. We always proceed assuming innocence. No hypothesis, nothing going on. Then we have to get enough evidence to tilt the scale towards guilt. Statistical significance. What happens in a court if the prosecutors don't have enough evidence? What does the jury say? They say, we the jury find the defendant not guilty. I just watched the OJ thing on Netflix. <laughs> oh, lovely. The jury will say not guilty. Now we assume innocence to proceed, but do they ever prove innocence? They might say there's inconclusive evidence, but they never say there's absolutely no evidence. They're innocent behind, beyond a shadow of a doubt. No, we, we cannot prove innocence. We ask the prosecutors to prove guilt, and we pr do the same thing in a hypothesis test. We assume nothing's going on, and we try to find evidence. Now, if we fail, to get statistical significance. If our p-value is not under the alpha criteria, we cannot say that means there's no relationship, that there's nothing going on. All we can say is there's inconclusive or insufficient evidence of a relationship or a connection. Because maybe if we had a bigger sample, a longer duration, or a different design, we would be able to pick it up especially when you're doing a dissertation research because of the limitations of budget and time and resources that you have. It's especially important that you, if you do not find a link, it could just be because it was a fluke or you didn't have a big enough sample size or something like that. So in a hypothesis test, we either say we proved there was a difference or we say we were unable to prove. We never say that they are equal. Make more sense when we do some examples. Okay. So we assume the null hypothesis is true in the population. And then we look at our sample and say, are the averages the same in our samples? They're not gonna be identical, so how different are they? That's what we're gonna look at with the p-value. Okay, I think we already said that. Okay, so here's some pictures of a two-tailed test and a one-tailed test. So both of these normal curves have shaded 5% of the area under the curve. The top curve has 2.5% in each tail. The bottom one has all 5% in the same tail. The top curve shows a two-tail test. The bottom curve shows a one-tail test. Where the shading ends is our cutoff as far as our z-score would be. So in that top curve, what is the z-score cutoff for a two-tail test? What number on the z-scale? 1.96. 1.96. It's almost two. Remember, we have about 95% is plus or minus two standard deviations. So if 95% is in the center, then 5% is in the combined tails. Half and half. Symmetrical. So if we are doing a two sample Z test and our criteria is alpha 0.05, 
we can also use a criteria of z equals 1.96. On the bottom curve, we're doing a one-tail test. If we still have alpha equals 0.05, what's our z cutoff now? Not 1.96. Sam, I see you mouthing it. <laughs> 1.65. 1 1.65. These numbers will come up over and over again, and if you look them up enough times in that stinking Z table, you will memorize them because you see them so many times. Those shaded areas, see where it's gray out in the tail? Whether it's two or one, those are also called the rejection region. So on that top curve, if our Z score is bigger than 1.96 in either direction, we say we reject the null hypothesis. In the bottom one, we only reject if it's in the, the tail that we've chosen beyond 1.65. So, uh, yeah. I have a question about this. So, if you guess that uh, the relationship is in one direction, but it's not, it's in the other direction and potentially, do you have to like start all over? Is that like a false finding because you haven't designed the study that way? Like That's one of the reasons we always try to do a two-tail test. Um, it's because even if we're pretty sure it's gonna happen in one direction, we're pretty sure that the new method's not gonna be worse because we're doing extra or we're pretty sure that family history is not gonna be protective, it's gonna be detriment, a risk factor. It's pretty clear based on theory and prior research. Even if we anticipate the direction, we'll often still do a two-tail test in case the opposite happens, because it could happen. Um, the other reason that we almost always go with a two-tail test is if you do a one-tail test, people think that you might be trying to be sneaky and kind of brush things under the rug in that if your two-tail p-value is 0.06, if you change it to a one-tail test, now your p-value is 0.03. And we went from above the cutoff to below. And so people see doing a one-tail test as kind of being too lenient or kind of, it's not conservative. So a lot of times a two-tail test is done even if there's strong evidence of a specific direction to be conservative. So why would you do a one-tail test if they're less? Um, if you have a very specific hypothesis, hypothesis <laughs> um, there are times when it can be called for. I was on a grant with Dave Bolton here in the kinesiology department, and he was looking at balance and older people, and um, the specific thing was, there was a, something called a stop signal reaction time. So test, so you people that are seated, and you have your hands on the desk, and there's a screen, and it says, tap your, and it has like a, a right, or the word right or left on the right and left side of the screen, and one will light up, and when that one's lighting up, you're supposed to tap your right finger, and this one's lighting up, you're supposed to tap your left finger, I think I have that backwards. Anyway, it tells you which finger to tap, and then at, at a, get a random time, it'll either beep or say stop, and you have to stop. And there's a pad under your finger that measures, you know, whether you're tapping or not. And so that test measures how quickly you can stop when you're given the signal to stop. And it's prior research has shown that the better you are at that, the more you are at inhibiting reactions in your body. And he wanted to show the connection. So that test is easy to do, administer. People just sit in a chair, because he wanted, he studies specifically balance and falling in elderly people. Pretty easy to have someone sit at this computer with their hands on the desk and just tap their fingers and try to stop when the thing beeps. The other, the other option for testing this response or lack of inhibition is to put someone in a harness, and he does this in his lab here in the hyper building. You get in this harness in your body and they have you lean against the wall and the harness is hooked to the wall that holds you there. And then they release it at given times and you're supposed to take a step to catch your balance. And they're me measuring lots of things like the muscle activity in your legs and your hands and they have these goggles, it's really complex. But he wanted to show that older people, 
the connection between the stop signal reaction time with the fingers and the actual physical ability to limit and take a step or not step, depending on what was called for. And in that case, it was very clear there was either there was going to be you were better at this one, you were better at the other one, or there was no connection. It wasn't like you were going to be better at this one and bad at that one. There wasn't going to be a negative association. So in that one, we did a one tail test for one direction. Um, it was a very controlled, randomized experiment with a lot of prior documentation. And it was like a phase one. And so it was a very clear situation where we did a one tail test. But if you have evidence in one tail, you almost always will have evidence in two tail. If you look at those rejection regions, the cutoffs, a Z of 1.65 versus a Z.1.96, how different are they? They're pretty close to the same cutoff. And so it's seen as kind of fudging it if you choose one over the other in most situations. It, when in doubt, go with the two tail, most definitely. And that's why it's going to be our default on the homework. But alpha 0.05, because people are used to it, and two tail because it's more conservative. And that's what we do in real life. Okay. Yeah, it's more conservative. But we're going to prefer a two tail test. So, Sarah, if, yeah. if something says the p value is um, 0 0.04, mm -hmm. then it should tell you if it's one tail or two tail, so you know is it 0 0.02, 0 0.02, or is it 0.04? So, well, the p value, yeah, so the p value is either a one or two tail p value, and we'll do these, but unless it's it is assumed, especially in APA write-ups in most of the disciplines, that you will all, if it does not say otherwise, it is two-tailed. And it's very common at the end of a, so most manuscripts have a methods section and then the results section. A lot of times at the end of the methods section, there will be a sentence that says something like, um, significance levels of alpha equals 0.05 are used unless otherwise stated. It's assumed that you're doing a two-tailed test unless otherwise stated. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have a quick question. So I'm just trying to figure out why um, the two tailed is split, like the percentage is split. Is that just whatever the alpha is, you split in a two tail? Mm -hmm. And whatever the alpha is, you keep the same in a one tail test? Yep. Okay. I think it's going to get a little clearer in the next like half hour. So keep that. If it doesn't clear up in the next 10, 15, 30 minutes, bring that up again. Okay. Another way to think of the alpha level, the significance level, is it's a, the probability of a type one error, which whoever named these things, Kimberly, every time you teach this, you just want to like whip the person who decided to call these type one and type two errors. I mean, can we not get a little more creative than this? Because they are so easy to confuse which one's one, which one's two. Type one error is a false positive. Type two is a false negative. So here are my, my favorite pictures. So the type one is the man who the doctor's saying, you're pregnant. That is obviously not the truth. Versus type two error is the woman who's obviously big and round and the doctor says, you're not pregnant. Both of those are errors, but they're different kind of errors. So sometimes um, I've heard people use the story of the little boy who cried wolf of trying to use that to remember which one's which. So what happened with the little boy who was sent out in the field to watch the sheep and he's all alone and he's really bored and he decides he's gonna do what? His job is to make sure the sheep are safe and he's supposed to run and let everyone know if a wolf comes so they can come chase him away. Well, he's bored, so he runs into town and cries, there's a wolf, there's a wolf, when there isn't to get some excitement going. All the townspeople grab their pitchforks and their torches, run to the field to defend their flocks. There's nothing there. And they scold him and say, don't do that. And he proceeds to promise he won't. And yet he does it again and again. And then finally, what happens the day the wolf really comes? And he co runs into town screaming, there's a wolf, there's a wolf. No one believes him. They th think at that point it's a false alarm. So a type, what did he do first? He sounded alarm when there was no cause. So a type one 
error is when we sound the alarm and we say, there's something going on, there's connection, there's a group difference, when in fact it really isn't. It was a fluke or something else was wrong. So that's a type one error. Alpha, that significance level, is what we set or what we want to set our tolerance for of type one error. Now, why would there's, well, we'll come up with that in a second. Okay, so alpha is the probability of having a type one error, what we set before we do our experiment. What can we live with? How small does that p-value need to be in order to declare evidence? And also, what false positive rate can we live with? And that should be determined on a situation by situation basis. But usually we use alpha 0.05 because we want to rest. So why don't we make alpha be 0 0.0001? Make a really, really small false positive rate. We don't want false positives. Let's make that probability really tiny. Because then you'll miss the truth. There is some trade-off. When you set the type one error rate really, really low, it will inflate, not at a one-to-one -one ratio, but it has a tendency to have an offset influence on making the type two error rate increase some. Now, in most research situations, the type one error rate is worse than a type two. And that's why one study, if it finds significance, that's exciting, but it's not like the be all end all. We want that mountain of truth. Um, we set our false positive low, but our, our type one error rate, but our type two error rate, usually a little higher. So there is always, you know, some trade off there. Okay. So what are uh, every single statistical method we're going to learn? This is true because in reality, every statistical test is based on some assumptions. One of my very favorite quotes is all models are wrong by George Box of Box Cox or Box and Whisker Plot fame. That all models are wrong but some models are useful. So all statistical models are based on some assumptions and those are a lot simpler than the truth in real life. In real life, there is more than one thing that influences reading, there's more than one thing that influences cancer risk. There are a lot of things that are all mushed together and interrelated. But when we do a statistical model, we simplify down to saying there's just two groups and all these other simplifying assumptions. How well our actual reality matches those assumptions, that's in, that how well they match is, that is how well the results are going to be representative. You can run a, a two sample t-test on a whole bunch of data. You can have a huge sample size, but if it's garbage data going in, the results coming out are going to be garbage. Um, when we very first had the COVID-19 crisis happening, the only data we had was the data that China had released. And based on that data going in, what did it, the models tell us coming out? The very, very first. What did the, do you guys remember what the first models, I mean, it's been like six weeks, I know we forget. The very first model said like, half the country is going to die or something. If you get this, you are going to die. The, the death rate was like seen at maybe 6% of people that get it are going to die. But that was based on some really um, questionable data at the least. And as time went on and we were able to gather more accurate and random sample data, we're able to see that the death rate is more like maybe half a percent depending on risk factors and age and all this other stuff. However, this is a very important point that the results you get out of any test, the quality of those results depends on the quality of the data that you give the model or the statistical test. And there is nothing, nothing that can be done statistically to fix non-representative samples. Garbage in, garbage out. 
nothing to do. Even if you have a ginormous 100,000 subject sample, if it's not representative, ain't nothing you can do. And you just, you can run a test, but don't count on counting on those results to mean anything. Um, a lot of times, I'll, I, especially when I first started here, I had people say, I wanted to do this study and I went and got the data, but my non-response, I only got like 15% of my surveys back. Melissa's shaking your head, no, what? Tell us, Melissa, why are you shaking your head? Well, that's not representative. Um, I mean, you need a way higher response rate than that. And, and you need to know why did people not respond? Were the people that responded just a certain category or you don't know that? There's no way to know who responded and who didn't because the non-responders are unknown. Um, there have been in history times when there have been political like presidential elections, one rather recently, where the polls made a certain party pretty sure that their person was gonna win and then when the election was tallied, the other person won. Um, why were those exit polls wrong? Either people were lying <laughs> because of leading questions. or They may not have sampled a representative population. Yeah, who were they sampling? Was it representative? Some of the early, um, so early on they did random digit dialing to do political surveys. And they were pretty accurate. And then all of a sudden they went very wrong and they found out, oh, certain people are choosing to not have their telephone number listed in the phone book. And so that segment of the population was not being represented in the sample. There's lots of um, examples through history of this happening. So what does that mean to you? When you are planning your proposal for your dissertation data gathering, what can you do to make sure your sample is representative of the population you hope to generalize to? Good question. Tell us. It depends. <laughs> I will tell you, I had a consultation yesterday with a PhD student. Um, I believe he's in Teal. And he, I think he's a principal or something in a school. And he's looking at at-risk children in middle schools and especially minority students and um, home visits when there's two teachers go out and visit the home of the student. And he wants to know how successful these home visits are in changing the family's um, sense of belonging and, and the importance of education and the student and the teacher. And he was asking me, what size of sample do I need first off? And this school that he, district that he was gonna use that had available to him, he had connections with, had like, I think it was like in the ballpark of maybe 5,000 middle school students, but they only anticipated 10% were at risk according to his criteria, the minority at risk. But he was not able to control which teachers actually went out and made the home visits and which families allowed the home visits because it was not random and the families could choose to participate or not. So is that gonna be a problem? He wanted to make a statement and gather evidence that the home visits were beneficial in changing attitudes. Well, even though he can't choose it, shouldn't it have, like a well-designed study should have washed out, right? So shouldn't it have balanced out even if it's out of his control? Do you think that it was random which families chose to have the visit and which families chose not to participate in the visit? Well, there's an equity and opportunity issue here for sure, right? So it may indicate more of something about privilege than about home visits. But in theory, isn't that what they tell us in our other stats classes? Just make sure it's randomized and it'll wash out. <laughs> that, what, but he couldn't randomize. He cannot randomize who, who actually participates in the visiting program. That's the call. It's more like a case study to me. He was, he was choosing to do a mixed methods paper, 
or dissertation. So he was going to definitely be doing interviews and qualitative studies as well, but he wanted to have a quantitative component. There is nothing he can do to control which families actually allow the teachers to come to their home. And there's absolutely nothing he can do to make certain teachers more into going out and visiting. So there are some things he, that are very important in that case. He needs to take very careful descriptive demographics and background information on what those families are like. Are they more likely two parent homes with only a few kids? Or are they more affluent of the ask risk? Are they living, you know, he needs to be able to describe who is in his sample so that his generalizations are limited to like families and situations. But also, Sam, you brought up a big thing. How can you interject random? So his other concern was he cannot control who is doing the home visits, which families participate, but he also had a very real concern. Okay, so there are 60 families that have the home visits. Not all of them are gonna fill out the questionnaire, the survey information. He's gonna get incomplete data. What do you do if you know you're gonna have some non-response? You know you're gonna have some missing data and it's probably not gonna be at random. These are non-trivial issues and they're real issues that have a huge impact on your statistics and you have to iron them out in the planning stages. So in talking to him, we did some power analysis to get some estimates on sample size he'd need. He's gonna do a two group T test like we're gonna do in chapter six today. Um, comparing it's the BRRRS, I don't know if any of you are um, in education are familiar with that, a BRRRS um, confidence subscore. Um, to compare, they do a retrospective pre to a post pre doing a paired samples T test. So I guess it's not chapter six, it's chapter nine. Anyway, um, he, um, should he try, should he give the surveys to all 60, 60 ish families and just hope that he gets 30 back? If we, cause we decided the sample size needed to be about 30. Is, is there a limit to how many surveys he can send out? Can you send out? He can send out? unlimited surveys out, but he needs to get, 30 complete back. Does he just take the whatever comes back? Isn't there like a stratification thing? Like you could do a stratified study. What I suggested was you have limited time, energy, and budget in a dissertation. You really do. It's not an R01 National Institute of Health grant where you have five years and a million dollars, right? So he could either hand out the surveys to everyone and just hope he got a random subset back, which is like very unlikely, or he could choose to only give the surveys to a random half and use his time and energy to go back and revisit the family and say, hey, can you really fill this out for me? And spend his time and energy instead of giving more surveys and getting a big enough biased group back, trying to get a complete random subset back, complete data. So with data, sample okay. size is important, but representation is even more important. Before you go on, can I just say I'm glad you're going to be there to poke holes in all of our plans. <laughs> this will be great. I hope that you guys all consult with me in your planning stages. And it's not because I think that I know everything, because that is definitely not the case. But sometimes it takes some outsider's eye to say, now, wait a second, this could be a problem. And the more experience you have, the more you're able to anticipate. And that's why you guys put together a committee of multiple people to help kind of figure out before we get too far down the road, what's gonna be a potential pitfall. Now I will guarantee every single one of you will have at least one pitfall that is not anticipated by anyone. That's real life. That's what happens in research. 
However, the more pitfalls you can anticipate beforehand, the smoother your life goes forward. Um, I had someone just today um, at 11 o'clock a consultation, a student doing a thesis, and she had proposed an SEM model and with a factor in regression, and we ran it and it failed to converge. And the problems were apparent in her, her data that the variable she was trying to put in a factor, which means nothing probably to you guys, but the correlation needs to be high. Well, the correlation between those variables only ended up being 0.36, and it was very low. And so her hypothesized AIM-3 was now defunct. Like she couldn't run those models, they failed and she'd propose them. So she was like, what do I do? Can't do anything. You propose to do this and something else happens. Part of the thesis and dissertation process is if that happens, you need to show that you know what you plan to do, what you would have done, and explain why you were not able to do that. What prevented that from being the case? And if you could go back, what would you do differently? I mean that might not, may or may not fly in a peer-reviewed journal publication, but it will definitely be sufficient in a thesis or dissertation. Because, you know, you're, it's kind of a student project. It's somewhere between a homework class assignment and a publication, usually. But um, really figuring out how to make your sample representative and what are your threats to validity, threats to representation, is a case-by-case -case thing. And that's why one of the reasons that the stat studio exists is to deal with those. I mean, I can tell you that you need to have a representative sample, but what the threats to that are in your situation depends on a lot of things about your situation. And so again, it's part of your committee's job to help you and I'm here to help you to do the best job we can at getting a representative sample and injecting as much randomness into it as we can. It's much better that this student that I talked about that he able to pick randomly select 30 of the families and really go back and do all that he can to get complete data instead of just throwing surveys out to 100 families and hoping he gets 30 back and having no idea how those 30 are different than the 70 that did not return their surveys. Real research is messy. That's why I like stats. It's messy. Um, and the degree to which you have a representative or non-representative representative sample is one of the limitations of every study. So every journal article you read has a limitation section at the end, it should, and one of those limitations is the nature of the sample. It always is less than perfect. Let's see. So, Assumptions of a z-test, a one-sample z-test, is that you have a random sample. Now, how do you get a random sample? Somebody be brave and tell me who you want to survey, either make it up or what you actually want to survey, and how you think you're going to get a random sample of those individuals. So I actually want to study um, young students who are academically dysfunctional and kind of socially dysfunctional. Socially particularly like groups what that age? Are, say again? What age? So possibly elementary school to make it easier, but um, also like young adult sort of ages where they're actually in the justice system and have acted out in antisocial ways. So how are you gonna randomly select such at-risk people? Children? I have no idea. And they're super vulnerable too, so. And, and going to drop out of the program. <clears throat> yeah, so you know, how are you going to get that? How are you going to find? So random sample means you take a list of every possible person in that population and write their names on paper and put them in a hat and mix it all up and randomly select out off the list. Or you use a random number generator to select off the list. You know, that's less writing and you don't need a big hat. But, um, or you flip a coin or whatever random process you're going to do. What if you don't have a complete list of everyone in the population? Like, now, this, the first population you said, socially at-risk elementary students, well, you might be able to go to a district and get a list of their elementary students that are enrolled that year, but how do you determine which ones are that enrollment category of, like, socially 
whatever your criteria is. That's a little harder. I don't know. Um, now the juveniles that are in the juvenile system, ah, you can probably get a list of those, but how do you, like, you have to be careful with at-risk populations because you've got to be able to go through IRB and their protected populations and you can't take advantage of them and we've got ethics and all those concerns, you know, and you've got lots to think about here. Um, it would be best if you could go to like Cache County Juvenile Detention Center, get a full list and randomly select some. But even if you could get a random subset, what do we always have to allow our participants to do? Consent. They've got a consent and they can pull out at any time. So you can never prevent that. So you want to, when you're designing your study, think about how can we do this in a way that will be less likely to have them drop out? So you have to think about what time you're demanding of them, how uncomfortable it's going to be for them. Are you going to pay them with a gift card? What, can, what are you going to do? You know, what's ethical and what's feasible to get them to complete and not demand too much? It's a big deal. I see grad students all the time that they want to um, do their life's work. So they have a bajillion research questions and they want to administer 30 questionnaires to every participant. What happens when you ask someone to do 30 questionnaires? They rarely finish. They don't want to do it. Um, they're less likely to take it seriously. They get tired at the end. You know, you have to really really, especially with your dissertation, really zone in on what are the one or two things you want to focus on. Because if you increase, if you try to focus on everything, you're gonna really drive up your non-response rate and your randomness and your representativeness is gonna go out the window. Okay, second assumption, I'm gonna move forward. This is all fun conversations. These are like my favorite topics. Um, this, we are, are always, in, when we do a Z, Z test for means, we are assuming that the spread, standard deviation has to do with spread, the spread in the sample is approximately the same as the spread in the population. Now, you notice the bullet points here? There's no test for this because we can calculate the standard deviation of the sample, we've got them measured, but can we calculate the standard deviation of the population? Heck no, we don't even know how big the population is to begin with. So this is a judgment call. It's almost impossible to test, but it is still an assumption. And we need to be able to have some good faith in this, the validity of this assumption. The last assumption. Yay, something we can actually statistically test. Hallelujah. So these are the three assumptions of the Z-test. You can probably guarantee that this, there's going to be a question about this on the exam, by the way. What are the assumptions of a z-test? Random or at least representative sample spread, i.e. standard deviation of the sample is approximately equal to that in the comparison population, and three, that your variable is normally distributed. How? Oh, we have some tools here. How do we know if a variable is normally distributed? I showed you the bullet points, but. We can do those QQ plots. We can do the QQ plots. We can look at a histogram and see is it like a bell curve and mostly symmetrical. The QQ curve are the points on that diagonal line. We can do the histogram. Is it mostly symmetrical? And the whiskers are a little longer than the box. Um, we can definitely do those. I find the plots are the best way to judge normality in the real world. Now, people, don't like that sometimes in textbooks especially and so there are some other suggestions for testing normality um, one of the rules of thumb that's easier kind of an eyeball test is you take the skewness and the kurtosis divide them by the standard error and see if it's bigger than two positive or negative um, so you can look at the skewness and kurtosis i find those not very helpful but people re will report skewness and kurtosis as a way of getting at normality and then other people have tried to come up with a p-value inferential test for normality. And these have, um, are very popular in textbooks and are not very popular in the real world. 
because if you have a small sample, they say everything's normal. And if you have a big sample, they say nothing's exactly normal. And so there has not been a perfect test developed for judging normality. The best we do have is the Shapiro-Wilkes test, and that is pretty good for small sample size. Small in like sample sizes of 30-ish or smaller. Shapiro-Wilkes is pretty good at judging whether or not a distribution is normal, a variable that has a normal distribution in the sample. If you have a large sample, say 100 or 500 in your sample, there's a similar test, and I don't even know how to pronounce it, the Klomolov-Smirma test, okay? That's how much we're gonna use it in this class there. Um, so, but the Shapiro-Wilkes can be used, um, and a lot of times in social sciences, we have samples in the 50, 30, 20-ish range, so those, those are often reported, although I would not put too much uh, weight on them. I would always, if you need to judge normality, make a histogram and or a QQ plot and judge based on the plot. I have a question for you, Sarah. Yeah. So like, let's say income. It's never going to be normal no matter what you do to it. Mm -hmm. But if I get a large enough N, do, does the, do the analyses care? I mean, as long as I've got several hundred people, because I got the central limit theorem, I'm going to mm -hmm. have a normal... Yeah. So distribution what, for sample means. Yeah, so Kim, thanks for bringing that up. That first bullet point is important. And it says the central limit theorem that we learned, remember last chapter in chapter four, we said that if your distribution is like this and you take a sample, what happens to the distribution of the sample means? It becomes narrower. So not only does it become narrower, but whatever the shape, it becomes more normal. So as the sample size gets bigger, the shape for the distribution of the sample mean becomes more normally distributed. That, so if your population is normally distributed, the sampling mean is guaranteed to be normal. If your sample like income is, in, the population income is skewed, the sample distribution for the mean will be approximately normally distributed as long as your sample size is in the neighborhood of 20 or 30-ish. The less normal your population, the bigger the sample size you need, but even 20 or 30 is usually sufficient. So even though this is important to, have, to test the normality of a distribution, you can get away with violating this assumption a lot easier than you can get away with violating the first assumption of representation. There's nothing you can do to fix a non-representative sample. But if your distribution is a little not normal, you're gonna be okay. So every all models are wrong, some models are useful. All models have assumptions, some assumptions are more important than others. So the order that these assumptions are listed on the slide, the most important one's first, and the least important one is at the bottom. Now, I find that students are very, very unhappy with here where I've written small n and large n. You wanna know what's a small sample and what's a big sample? And the answer is it depends on how non-normal the sample is. There's no clear rule. But in general, in this regard, if we say small sample, we mean like 20, 30-ish, and large sample is like 100, 200-ish but there's a lot of ground in between there. Okay. Any questions so far? I'm talking tons. It's like a talky day. I like example days better. Okay, so we are gonna we are gonna do examples, don't worry, we will do examples, but we're trying to get through all these slides first. The next slide is about reporting re your results. So you do a test, you've got to communicate your results to somebody else. Um, if not, why did we do it? You've got to, I mean, communication is key here. And APA is the format that we're gonna com com convey our results. So when you write your APA results, you should include, and Melissa, you brought this up before, you should be including the alpha level, the significance level, and how many tails your test is. But again, if you don't read about them, 
you are pretty safe to assume alpha 0.05 two tailed, but we should probably get in the habit of being clear in our writing. The second bullet here is we need to report our p values to, it says two decimal places, but um, I think it's three decimal places. In APA, we usually do three decimal places on our p values. Um, in the past, in the good old days, which in some fields is like last month, um, you will find articles that report p-values either as greater than 0.05 or less than 0.05. You'll only find those two p-values in an article. That is not going to fly anymore. So if you do a lit review, you might find that kind of p-values listed only greater than 0.05 or only less than 0.05. But if you try to submit something like that, you will probably get um, reviewers chewing you up. Um, I had one article that someone came to me a few months ago. Well, no, it's probably been a year or two. It's been a long time. Um, that the reviewer, they had written p-values greater than 0.05, less than 0.05 only. And the reviews had come back and the journal editor said, please present your p-value, uh, your significance as Naaman Pearson p-values. I was like, what the heck? Because they didn't know what that means. So they came to me and I'm like, I don't know what they mean. And I Googled it because I Google everything. And basically what that means is they want three decimal places shown on your p-value, not just saying whether or not it's bigger than or littler than 0.05. So the p-value doesn't just give you a yes or no decision, but it actually, you want to know how small. If it's less than 0.05, is it just 0.049? Or is it 0 0.0001? The only exception to this rule is if you have a p-value that's really tiny. It shows here in the like light gray, the last thing on the slide, you can write p is less than 0 0.001. If you're only going with three decimal places, 0 001. If, if you were going to do two decimal places, it would be 0 01. Don't do that. If it was going to be four decimal places, it would be 0 0.0001. And we'd use the less than instead of the equal sign. Um, usually because we don't want to like put this, you know, huge number. We don't want to put point and then 10 zeros and then a number because, you know, space. Um, so p values, that's very important um, because it's very much changing in the literature requirements these days. So here's an example of a conclusion that you could write for this is you know, a made up example here. A one sample V test. So you want to say what test was run. In chapter five talks about one sample V test. So a one sample V test showed that the difference in the quiz score between the current sample and the hypothesized value was statistically significant. Now notice in the parentheses, they've given the summary information. N is the Sample size. Sample size. Capital M is the mean. Capital S D is the standard, standard deviation. deviation. Okay. So mean standard deviation, sample size, if now you don't have to have all of those in the sentence, but if any of those that you put in a sentence, those go in parentheses. Now look at the end of the sentence. The Z value and the P value are not in parentheses. They are separated with commas. And it looks awkward, but this is APA. So you put the Z score. Now, the, the general rule of thumb on writing these things, and nobody follows them perfectly, but um, we're going to show two decimal places on every number that has a decimal. Well, sample size, it's a whole number, so we don't need that. But we're going to use two decimal places, except for p-values, we're going to show three. Now, they've shown the 6.000 to three decimal places. I would have probably chosen two, because usually we just want to be consistent. Okay. All right. <sighs> we can finally get to an example. And we're halfway through the slideshow. Hey, so Sarah. Mm -hmm. Just one more time, the, the current sample, you put kind of the descriptives of it in parentheses. In parentheses. 
and then but what you found not. So in this, this one, you're not given the background information. So in this situation, we're comparing a one sample Z test. A lot of times are done to compare to a historic value. So maybe the historic value or like a passing value is six. And we want to know is our sample different than six? Well, in this, this or in the population, is it different than six? We want to know about the population. In the sample, what was the average? Seven. Is seven bigger than six? Well, yeah, they're not the same, but is seven big enough that we are have clear evidence that it is truly higher in the whole population? This sample had an average of seven. What's our best guess for the average of the whole population? If the sample average is seven, what do you think the population average? It should be seven. Close to seven. Is it is seven? Seven was exactly what the average in the sample was. Is the whole population average guaranteed to be seven? No. No, it's going to be close-ish to seven. That standard deviation and that sample size give us some evidence how sure we think that it's really close to seven. Close, is it going to be closer to seven or closer to six? When we do the Z test. So the hypothesized value, they just got that from? Thin air. I don't know. <laughs> Here it's just made up. Let's do an example where we do have background information, shall we? Here is an example that we will do that actually has some numbers and some background. So this is our first example. We have a town that had an earthquake hit. And after the earthquake, a random sample, we're going to assume it's representative because it's random, so just take their word for it, random sample, I don't know how they got it, of townspeople, they measured their anxiety levels, and they're in the green numbers there. So they calculated their anxiety scores. They had them fill out a questionnaire and score. So if we, now this is a key here, assume that the general population has an anxiety score that it's, it's expressed as a T score. So this anxiety tool, this measurement scale, has already been validated and norm referenced. If it's a capital T score, what does that tell us? We read about this in the previous chapter. Capital T score, we assume, is always scored so that the mean is 50 and the standard deviation is 10. Those are the units for a capital T score. Um, does anyone use capital T scores for anything for, um, in your careers? A lot of um, scores are T referenced, norm referenced. You guys haven't seen them? There's a lot of these, um, I know a lot of autism rating scores are um, score re norm reference to a T score. They've been, the scores are adjusted so that the entire national average is 50 and the standard deviation is 10. Okay, how big is our sample size right here? Anyone count it? 10. 10. Oh, that's a nice number. N equals 10. Okay. This is why I wanted to do it on my other one so I could write on it. Okay. Um, and our mu, mu of like the national average is 50 and sigma for the national average is 10. Now, what was step one of our hypothesis test? What's step one? Our hypotheses. We need a null hypothesis no. and a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. What's going to be our null hypothesis? If this earthquake did nothing. The mu would equal zero? Would the mu equal sorry, zero? <laughs> mu would be 50. The yeah. town's average would be 50. If the earthquake did nothing, that'd be just like everybody else. So our null hypothesis is mu of the town is equal to mu of the nation, 50. So you could write that as H with a little sub zero, mu of the town is equal to the number 50. So 50 is like our number six in the last example, Melissa. It's just this number that we're re referring to, our national average or a prior average or some hypothesized value. Now, eyeball. 
eyeball test. If you look at those green numbers, do they average 50? So Sam, here's a question for you. Should we do a one-tail test or a two-tail test? Two-tail test. Why? Because we have no idea. We have no idea. But realistically, what do you think is going to happen with anxiety scores after an earthquake? I think they're going to increase. We think they're pretty clear they're probably going to increase. Um, but we're still going to do a two-tail test. Why? To be really conservative and not have someone be like, well, what if it went the other way? Maybe they're like, oh, the worst has happened. Now we're okay. The shoe dropped. Yeah. Just to be conservative. Okay. So what would our alternative hypothesis be if we're going to do the two-tail test? So it would be the mu does not equal 50. It would be mu is not equal to 50. Now make sure when you write your hypotheses, it's mu, not x bar, or capital M. Capital M for the mean is only a sentence thing, not a formula hypothesis thing. We use x bar in our formulas. Got to be crazy. OK, so we have a sample of data. What is the average there? Well, before we do it, let's, um, let's do step two according to our hypothesis. We're going to do a one sample z test, because that's all we know about right now as far as this class is concerned. We have one sample of townsfolk, and we're comparing their average to the number 50. Now, I've written on here, this first normal curve is the distribution of all single individuals in a population. We're assuming that single individuals have a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. But what about all possible samples? The average would still be 50, but what would the spread number be for all sample averages? Not the full standard deviation of 10, but the standard the error. The standard, standard error. 10 divided by the square root of the sample size, which was 10. So our spread is 10 for individuals in the population. But the sample average, we use the standard error, so we divide by the square root of the sample size, which actually was also 10. I'm sorry, they're the same number. That's confusing. So the standard error is 3.167. Now, if we're going to do yellow here down at the bottom, oh, don't let me highlight down there. We're going to do alpha 0.05 and a two-tail test. What's going to be my z-score cutoffs? One point nine six. One point nine six. That number we're going to accidentally memorize. <laughs> okay. So we know if we calculate the z-score for these green numbers, if we get something that's bigger than positive one point nine six or smaller than negative one point nine six, we'll say earthquake increased anxiety. What happens if we don't fall that extreme? What if our z-score was like really close to zero? what would the conclusion be about earthquakes and anxiety? That somehow magically they don't increase anxiety, which... <laughs> Is our conclusion that earthquakes do not increase anxiety? No, we just can't reject the null. I mean, we can't ex accept it. We have to say fail to reject. Yeah, we've got... Now, we don't have to use the words fail to reject, but our conclusion needs to say something that there is not enough evidence to prove that the earthquake increased anxiety. We can't prove that they stayed exactly the same. Remember, we can't prove innocence. We can just say failed to find it guilty. We, fa we might fail or be unable to show that the anxiety levels changed after the earthquake. Okay, all right, so here, since I can't write it all at once, I just throw it all up at the same time. So once we get our sample, I added up all those green numbers with my calculator, because you know mental math is hard, um, so it's Barbie. And I got 580. 580 is the total of all of them, divided by 10, 58. So the sample's average is 58. 
Is 58 the same as 50? No, but we, would we expect our sample to be identical to 50, even if earthquakes did nothing? Even if an earthquake does nothing, the samples could, are gonna be a little more, a little less than 50, depending on which sample we take. take. That standard error tells us how close we think our sample would come out, how close to 50 our sample should be if nothing's going on. Remember, null hypothesis, nothing going on. It's still 50, nothing changed. So we got our standard error. Standard error is the standard deviation in the population divided by square root of n. That's the formula from chapter four, was it? So then we find our z-score. Ah, chapter four is coming back. I'm not trying to be comprehensive, but looky there, comprehensive. So we find our z-score by doing the sample's average, 58, subtract the hypothesized average of 50. So how different is it? Eight, eight t-score points. But to standardize it, I'm gonna divide by the standard error. And our z-score comes out to be about two and a half. If we look at our picture here, this picture, I put the cutoffs at 1.96. Why did I put my cutoffs at 1.96? Because that's your alpha. Because that puts 5% in the combined two tails. So our rejection region is less than one, negative 1 1.96 or bigger than 1.96. And our observed t-score, our sample's t-score, falls in the rejection region. So by the critical, now these cut points, this 1.96, those cut points to get the alpha in the two tails, those are called critical values. The critical values are how extreme the z-score needs to be to get in the rejection region. Critical values. If you are that far away from the middle, you are critically different. And our sample does land in the rejection region, out in that little tail. So um, this was, right now, people that have big egos, how do they deal, have arguments and try to prove their egos nowadays? Like intimidation. <laughs> yeah, but where do you see that happening? Anyone think of anyone who's big shot, has an ego, and tries to prove it? What media? I don't know, our president. <laughs> Maybe yeah, through politics. like Twitter? Right? Yeah, a little, little bit. A little bit through Twitter. Well, back in the day when the hypothesis tests and p values and critical values and all this stuff was being developed, the people that were like the big wigs developing this were at different universities. And Twitter didn't exist. So the way that they pretty much like banged each over the head and said, I know better than you and I've got a better idea and you're dumb, um, was through these letters in the scholarly journals at the time. And um, Fisher and Naaman and Pearson and all these big wigs of the fathers of statistics used to bang each other over the head with, um, there were two um, schools of thought at the time. So one is that we use these, we decide on our alpha ahead of time. Based on the alpha and whether we're doing one tail or two tail, we look it up in the table and we decide on these critical value cut points. And then when we get our data, we see, do we reject or not reject? And it's a yes or no conclusion. Yes, we have evidence. No, we do not. So that was one school of thought. The other school of thought was, uh, you know, alpha is kind of a fuzzy, I mean, how do you know ahead of time, um, you know, instead of just saying yes or no, let's actually, instead of saying reject or not reject based on a set predetermined alpha, we are going to calculate a p-value. The p-value, what was that definition? Remember it was in the yellow box, I said it's convoluted because it's like English is weird. It's the probability, so on a curve, probability is the shaded area. So it's the probability of observing data that extreme 
or more extreme if the null hypothesis is true. The null hypothesis is that center value of 50. If the center value is 50, what's the chance of having an average of 58? So you do the z-score for 58, which when we convert 58 to a z-score, we got the number 2.52. So when you look up 2.52 in your z-table, you get a number for how much area is in the tail, the beyond z area. Now we're doing a two-tail test, so you have to double the area because we are opening the door that it could have gone the other way. And that p-value gives you not just the ability to say yes or no, it's less than 0.05, but you can also judge how much less than 0.05 it is. Okay. So in red down here, I, we have the conclusion. This is not APA style. This is like normal human being language, right? There's no numbers and p's and z's and weird things here. Our z-score fell in the rejection region. So what are we rejecting? The idea that nothing's going on, that it's still an average of 50 on the anxiety score. Now, even, this is important, so, you know, we need to have a break, but let's do this last thing before we take a break. Even if you are doing a two-tailed test, your conclusion is only gonna be one direction. You must state which direction it is in the conclusion. So you don't just say the earthquake changed the anxiety score. You have to say whether it made it go up or down. So after the earthquake, anxiety levels were higher than the national average. You don't just say that they were different. Even when we do a two-tailed test, we state which direction in the conclusion. And it's which direction our sample was. In our sample, the average was, in here in green, our average was 58. Our hypothesized value was 50. So we do need to say that it was higher, not just different. That's so interesting. Because like, if you're doing a, a I, I mean, if it follows the scientific method or logic, it's hard. I mean, this sample is higher, but that's not what you are out to prove. But we still want to say which direction in the conclusion. That's super interesting. Okay. And it's usually because our hypothesis really was in one direction, even though we just conservatively allowed for the two directions. Yeah. Okay. It is after 3.30. We definitely need a five minute break. I'm sorry we went so long. Next time we, I go over, just say time out, let's have a break, okay? I have a really silly R question for you, Sarah. No such thing, but yes. Could you? Okay. All right, so back to finish up our Z test, some cautions. When we do say something and difference is statistically significant, we're just saying that it is highly unlikely we would observe that data due to chance alone. It is not saying that it makes a sizable difference. So this is the idea that there is statistical significance and then there is practical importance. So if I'm talking about second graders learning to read and comparing two programs, I might have the old existing program results in students having a reading score at this level. And I might test a new reading level and it says that the reading levels are this high. And my p-value might say, those are statistically significantly different. That the new program result in higher scores than the previous system. But even if that is a statistically significant, meaning not just due to random chance difference, 
What if it only resulted in kids reading two more words per minute? Would that have practical implications? Would that, would I want to go to the hassle of making a statewide curriculum change on that alone? Even if there's a statistically significant difference, does it make a big enough difference to have a meaningful impact? It's a different question. So if we find, if we find evidence of a statistically significant difference, we must follow it up with an estimate of how big is the difference. And that's the idea of an effect size. And we'll be hitting that in the chapter on power, which is a little bit down the road. And it's, I think it's the later half of next week or the one after that. To know if the effect size is big enough to be relevant to have a clinical or a real world application impact. Um, because we find that if you have a large enough sample, every difference is statistically significant. So if I was able to get the test scores for every second grader in the state, I could show that everything makes a difference. But they might be minuscule differences. So we always, after we say there's a statistical significance, statistically significant difference, we want to follow it up with how big of a difference it made. So on that earthquake, we saw that the earthquake, after the earthquake, anxiety levels were higher. In this case, instead of being an average of 50, their average is eight. What was the standard deviation there? Remember? The standard deviation is 10. So if the average goes up eight points, that's that's significant. What if the average anxiety score only went up half a point? Maybe that's not having any clinical importance. So that's the idea of effect size. And we will come back to that later, but I wanted to make sure to note that now. That statistical significance does not mean it's a practical significance. And the last note, I know we've, we've, I've said this ad nauseum today, that Absence of evidence is not evidence of an absence. It's a fun thing. So just because you fail to reject does not meet, guarantee that nothing is going on. It just means you don't have evidence of a difference. Sometimes we fail to find statistical significance because our sample is too small. And that's the idea of a power analysis, which is that chapter with the effect size. So those are important things coming down the road. Okay, to wrap up the chapter, let's see how we can do this in R, because who wants to do stuff by hand? Not me. Even adding up 10 numbers on the calculator, I make a mistake. Okay, so we are gonna use the cancer data set for a lot of examples in class. On, in, in addition to Eno's data set, just to have another data set available. So here, Tyson made this slide. He's using the Rio package. It's just another way to import data. This is the cancer data. So I'm taking the cancer data in, and I'm gonna rename all the variables to lowercase. Um, I'm gonna make the ID factor, ID variable factor. There is a treatment variable, TRT, which has two groups. So this study, I think it might be real, don't quote me on that, has subjects in it that have oral can or neck cancer, oral and neck, can neck cancer. And a lot of times the treatment for cancer um, is especially, it targets cells that are dividing very, very quickly, and it can have very harsh um, effects on other parts of the body that divide very rapidly, like the mucous membranes inside your mouth. And so a com common side effect of chemotherapy is that their um, cancer patients get canker sores in their mouth, and it's very painful to eat. So this study was looking at whether swishing the mouth in the mouth with aloe vera juice, if that aloe juice helped with the, the oral condition, the cankers in the mouth, of these cancer patients. So to test it, it was a double-blind randomized controlled experiment. 
So the patients were randomly assigned whether they got a placebo or the real aloe juice, and they made them look as much the same as they could. So the TRT variable um, denotes whether they were on the placebo or the actual aloe juice. And then there's another variable called stage. It's whether they were stage one, stage two, stage three, or stage four cancer at the beginning of the study. So if I want to look at age, that was one of the variables they got. This is the age at the start of the study. And then this variable, total condition at week four. So this is the, they looked in their mouth and they counted and measured the sores and they rated the condition of their sores in their mouth at baseline and then at one week, two week, four week, and six weeks, I think. No, zero, two, four, six weeks. So that's another variable. So we use this command, this function verb, before the site package described. So this can give us not only the averages or the means, the standard deviation, but it can also give us measures of skewness and kurtosis. So if we look at the age variable, there were 25 patients in the study with an average age of almost 60, standard deviation of almost 13. Um, and at week four, the average oral condition was 10 and a third about, and the standard deviation of three and a half. So you can use skewness and kurtosis to, as one way to judge normality. They're not my favorite, but you can report them. The, other way, the second way I told you that you can um, judge normality was, is with the Shapiro-Wilkes test. So this is how you do it in R. You have to do it for each variable one at a time. So you start, as always, with the name of the data set. This one's called Cancer Clean, and we pipe it or flow it down into the dplyr poll step. This pulls out one, the numbers from one variable, and it pulls them out of the data frame into the vector container. That was what Kim just asked about. And this is a very old function in R, so it's just a base R function, Shapiro.test, an empty bracket. And it will spit out a Shapiro-Wilkes test. Now, it gives you a W value. We're not going to worry what that is. The big thing here is the P value. Now, what does the null hypothesis usually refer to? Null hypothesis means nothing going on. So here we're testing normality. So the null assumption is nothing's going on, it's okay, normal. Nothing's going on, it is normal. So this p-value, is it in the rejection region? What, how small would this need to be to reject? How small? 0.05. It would have to be less than 0.05, generally speaking, if we're gonna use that line. So it's not anywhere close to that small, right? So this is no evidence of violations of normality is how you would report this. So Shapiro-Wilkes test did not find any violations of normality in the age variable. If we were looking at this other variable, this total oral condition at week four, check out this p-value. Is it less than our traditional alpha 0.05? Yes. So that rejects the null hypothesis of nothing going on. And it says, this is evidence that the oral condition that we were measurements are not normally distributed. There's evidence of violating normality in this variable. How much typing do you have to do to get that number out? Not a lot. Name of the variable, name of the data set, pull out which variable you're concerned with, Shapiro.test. Not a whole lot of typing. You've done most of this before, right? It's just the last two words that you have to learn here. We like this learning a little bit more, right? Just a little, okay? The better way to judge normality, I said, was with a histogram or a QQ plot. We've already seen how to make a histogram, right? Start with the name of the data set, pipe it into ggplot. Then we have to tell it which variable, and that's the aesthetic, AES. So if I want to make a histogram of age, and then after we say ggplot, we add on layers instead of piping them. Yeah. So, and I've changed the bin width to five here, so five year intervals. 
So can you see that the average is close to 60 years? Yeah. What's how what's the age of the youngest person in here? Roughly. 25. A little, over, a little over 20. What about the oldest person? 85. Mid 80s. Yeah. So we've got some span here. If you look at that shape, how would you describe the shape? Pretty normal. Fairly normal. Fairly symmetrical. They're not perfect, but it's normal-ish, it's symmetric-ish, it's bell-shaped-ish, ish. Could you say there's a slight negative skew? There might be a slight negative, but again, the Shapiro Wilt does not, does not. find that. Um, there are limitations to both of these methods. The see, look at our skewness number. It was slightly negative. Now this kurtosis is very close to zero, but there is a very slight negative skewness. And here you see it in the number negative 0.31. Here you see it if you kind of squint your lines and say which way is it shifted. You can kind of see it in the picture, but it's not terrible. Now on this previous slide, what did we find out about the week four condition? Shapiro Wilkes says weeks four is, is not normal. So let's look at its histogram. Oh, there's a QQ plot for age. See how straight the points are on the line? Now this is new code, okay? This is how we made the histogram code. So here's new code. This is your second piece of new code today. Here's for a QQ plot. Let's see. We start with name of the data set. Okay, we're good there. Pipe it into ggplot. Okay, because we're gonna make a plot. We gotta have some aesthetics. This is different. You have to say sample equals age in order to do the QQ plot. You have to have sample equals there. It's always sample equals and then the name of the variable. And instead of saying geom histogram, you say geom QQ and it will build you a QQ plot. So this histogram showed pretty close to normal and the QQ plot set shows pretty straight of a diagonal line. But what, so this is age. Age is fairly normal. But that oral condition at week four didn't look good, did it? According to Shapiro Wilkes, not normal. Let's look at its plots. What do you think of that histogram? Is that normal? I don't see a bell curve there. It's fairly flat, you know, there are a couple little peaks and one little valley, but it's fair, it's more flat than peaked, bell shaped. Check out this QQ plot. You kind of have to squint your eyes a little bit, and if you kind of like followed it, it's kind of more of an S curve than it is a straight line. This S curve going from the first to the last, the S shape of the dot in the QQ plot is showing the same thing that the not bell-shaped histogram is showing. So all of these are ways to judge normality. You can do the site describe function to actually calculate skewness and kurtosis. Now, if we look at that total oral condition at week four, check out it's positively skewed, but that's a bigger number than the other one. And check out the kurtosis. Negative kurtosis mean instead of being peaked, it's more heavy-tailed or more flattened out. And we see that in the picture that it's more, instead of being peaked, it's more flattened out. It's still got some skewness. It's not flattened perfectly symmetrical, but it's definitely not a nice bell curve. So this is how you go about testing normality of variables before you do a z-test. Calculate skewness and kurtosis. Shapiro Wilkes test if your sample size is under 100 ish. If it's over, you use that other test, but we usually almost never do it. And then <laughs> make the plots is the best way to plot histogram and QQ plot to judge normality of a variable. Okay, that's how you test assumptions. You ready to see how to run the test? The Z test? Okay, it's pretty complicated code. Hey, oh, uh, Dr. Schwartz, can I ask a question about R? Yeah. What's the difference between dplyr pull and dplyr select? Kimberly asked this exact question on Just the break. Now. Oh, sorry. I, okay. 
So, so you know, if you're thinking it, somebody else definitely is. Yeah, so um, in this command, we pulled a variable. So this is what I said. The pull command, command that verb, will only pull one variable, and it takes it out of the data frame and puts it in a vector container. The, so the select command can take multiple variables, and it keeps them in a data frame. So what, which one you want to use depends on what you're going to do next. Shapiro, Shapiro.test wants a vector. And that's why we have to use the pull command. To pull the, from the data frame, that grid of numbers, pull out just the one variable and put it in a vector container. Oh, we didn't do the z-test. Let me check here. Do we do z-test? Encyclopedia home. Maybe we don't do these in. No, we just do t-test. Okay. How would we do the z-test? We would take the mean minus the hypothesized mean mu, divide by standard deviation over square root of n. What if I wanted to test the hypothesis that the average cap cancer patient is age 60? My null hypothesis is mu is equal to 60. I would have to convert our observed average to a z-score. So to do that, I would take my observed average, 59.64, minus our hypothesized value of 60. Again, if I want to know, are these patients age 60 or are they different? Then I divide by the standard error. How would I find the standard error? Standard deviation divided by square root of sample size. Hey, Sarah? Yeah. Oh, I see where the 59.6 came from. Where did the 60 come from? If I wanted to know, if, the, if, if our patients were different than the national average of 60 or something. For the oh. one sample test, you have to have some other value to compare it to. Gotcha. That has to be based on some, some relevant information. I seem to be having, I seem to be stuck on that. Thing. It's coming out of thin air is why, and you don't like that, neither do I. <laughs> Doing a one sample Z test is almost never a good idea, but we teach it first because it's simpler, because you only have one sample. Once you get two samples, things get a little bit more complicated. Okay. Let's jump into chapter six. You know what the best way to learn code is? Doing it. Take code that works and try to break it. Change something and see if it breaks. See how it affects it. It really is. And it's like with kids with Legos. How do they try to build something? They try to build something and if it doesn't work, they try it a different way. Uh -huh. So failing is not, not a negative here with coding and testing in this class, failing is part of the learning process. Okay. All right, so problems with the test. I love the history of this. I once on my um, course evaluations a couple years ago, I had a student um, give me a negative review and they said, I don't wanna know about the history of all this stat stuff. Now I just need to know how to use it. Do less of the history. I like, that's boring, okay. So here's the history. So, well, this is a, the version that I've been telling. I've probably changed it. You know how it is. If you don't read something that's written down, it gets changed time after time. This is the gist of the story. Kimberly, you've probably heard it enough. You can correct me. But um, once upon a time, Fisher developed the Z-test, the hypothesis test, they, you know, they already read about it, they existed. 
So there was a man that worked at a brewing company, Guinness Beer. Anyone heard of Guinness Beer? He worked for that company in quality control. And his job was, um, he was involved in testing the samples to decide if they were needed to change what was going on, if the pH was right, if what all this stuff was right, if they needed to, you know, change things. And so by taking samples. Now, when you're doing quality control, you know, with all statistics, a bigger sample is better generally, as long as it's representative, bigger is better with the sample. Why would you not want to take a big sample if you're doing quality control when brewing beer? What would be go on in the factory if you were taking ginormous samples or a lot, a lot of samples? They have to test them like, like yeah. they have to consume it? Well, yeah, to test it, are you, when you take a sample and test it, are you gonna put it back? No. No, you're gonna have to dump it. So what would happen if you took lots and lots and lots and hundreds of samples every day? Yeah, you're dumping a lot of product. You're dumping a lot of product. So in quality control, they have to find a middle ground and they often wanna do the best testing they can with taking as few samples as they can because you don't want to be wasting um, a lot of your sample in, um... oh, does this cover this? Let's do this. Oh, I love corny videos. Okay. We got a commercial first. Can you guys see this? Can you hear it? Okay. Skip that. Okay. As students of statistics, we owe a great debt of gratitude to our friends at the Guinness Brewing Company. You see, there's a lot of science that goes into brewing beer, and in 1903, Guinness got all sciency in creating an experimental malt house at their brewery at St. James's Gate in Dublin, Ireland. At this experimental malt house, the brewers slash scientists could grow all varieties of barley, from seed corn to harvest to malting to brewing to the final glorious product. In nature, Barley has a lot of variability, and one of these scientists slash brewers named William Seeley Gossett was very concerned about the variability Handsome. of the barley plants because you can't brew a consistent porter or stout if your barley is different from one season to the next. At the time, I lost sound. Anyone else? It muted her screen. For let me know, I'll back it up a little bit. From one season to the next. At the time, because you can't brew a consistent porter or stout if your barley is different from one season to the next. At the time, statisticians like Carl Pearson and Sir Francis Galton were using huge sample sizes which meant that the parameters they were estimating approached a normal curve. But for a young brewer estimating barley yields, the sample sizes were small, maybe three or four. And that is a problem because small sample sizes do not look like a normal distribution. But fortunately, William Seeley Gossett solved this problem for us. He created tables, now called T-tables, that account for the variability of small sample sizes. Of course, he wanted to publish his tables, but then... So here's where the story perverge. Some people will tell you that Guinness would not allow any of their employees to publish for fear of divulging trade secrets. Other people will tell you that Gossett published anonymously and that Guinness never found out until after his death. But according to the minutes of the Guinness board, Gossett was granted permission to publish with the stipulation that he used a pseudonym. And so in 1908, William Seeley Gossett published two articles in Carl Pearson's journal Biometrica under the pseudonym Student. And today, we still use Student's T-table whenever we do a T-test. 
So let us lift a glass to William Seeley Gossett to prove that a small sample size is nothing to be ashamed of and that some great things can come from statistics. <laughs> Statistics. Oh, all right. So that's what happened. <laughs> so our ha our handsome guy found out fixed. Um, so the nor idea of normality. All of the Z test works great if you have the large samples, but if you have smaller samples, yeah, it's not so accurate. So Gossett's tables um, and and. I, I've heard that he put um, his name as student because he was a student of statistics. But, you know, there's all kinds of stories floating around. Maybe so a the main, of beer. Yeah? Maybe a student of beer. That's student of beer, maybe. Probably both. Um, so he, um, he did work with Fisher, Naaman, Pearson, Galton. All of these big wigs were working together. Sometimes they agreed. A lot of times they bashed heads. They were very egotistical men. Um, very strong language used. They called each other idiots more or less a lot of times. But when you're working with a student, a small sample, we use S squared instead of sigma squared. And that's one of the main differences with the T test versus a Z test. The formulas look almost identical. See, there's, here's our Z formula that we typically do. The average in our sample minus the hypothesized average in the population. But if you divide by the sample standard deviation over the square root of N, and N is a small sample, we usually go with a T distribution instead of the Z distribution. Okay. So similarities, students T is the curve, if you plot it, looks very, very similar to our regular bell curve. It has its own mathematical function. It's symmetrical, bell-shaped, goes on to infinity, the mean is at zero, the area under the curve can be used to find probabilities. And when a, you have a large sample, T and Z are nearly identical. The difference is, is there's not just one Z curve and one Z table. There could be lots and lots and lots of different T distributions. And each T distribution is slightly different depending on its de degrees of freedom, which is an idea was brought up in chapter, was it two? One of those early chapters. So the degrees of freedom, we calculate by doing the sample size minus one. And it was the same idea when we had standard deviation, the biased and the unbiased standard deviation, whether we divide by n or n minus one. Now, um, so it goes along with that idea. So here's picture wise. This picture here, the purple top curve, solid curve, is the standard normal bell curve, the Z score. And then check out the teal solid line just underneath it. That's with degrees of freedom of nine. And even below that is the red dashed line, that's degrees of freedom equals two. The T distribution is the same as the normal distribution, it's just squished a little bit. It has a little less in the center and a little more in the tails or the wings. And the amount it is squished depends on the degrees of freedom. The smaller the degrees of freedom, the more it's squished. The bigger the degrees of freedom, the closer it is to being identical to the normal curve. So that's what it looks like. Now we have a table to go along with the T distributions, plural, but it's set up very differently from the, the table for the normal distribution Z. Our Z table is appendix A1, and how many pages does it take? Several, several pages, right? The T distribution is all on one page, even though there are multiple distributions because it doesn't show the entire table for every degrees of freedom. Now, um, I think they were published originally, but in our textbook, we only have what are the critical values listed for certain um, levels. So we're gonna learn how to use it. 
So for calculating the test statistic, we're going to compute a T score instead of a Z score, but it's going to work much the same way. Let's check the formula. So the formula for T is very similar to Z. On the top of the fraction, we have our sample average and we subtract the hypothesized population mu mean. The difference is on the bottom, we're dividing by the sta standard deviation from the sample, not the standard deviation from the population, and then dividing by the square root of n the same way for standard error. But we do have degrees of freedom that we need to pair this with. And the degrees of freedom are whatever the sample size was, take away one. So assumptions. Told you we got to learn the assumptions to go with every test. Does this look familiar? Sample must be random. Why? So it can be representative. Can't fix it. Got to plan as well as we can. The standard deviation of the sample population um, is approximately equal to the standard deviation of the comparison population. Again, can't test that. We're going to assume it. And we also have to assume that the variables have a normal distribution unless we have a large enough sample that we can let the central limit theorem take over. So the assumptions for the t-test are exactly the same as the assumptions for the z-test. Just exactly the same. The same. So let's do our example. So we've got a physician. He states, this is an assumption, this is a state, this is a number from thin air, right? Melissa, thin air number coming up, that the average number of times he saw a patient during the following year was five. So that's our comparison value is five. It's just coming from thin air as far as we're concerned. However, he believes that his patients have visited him, him more frequently during the past year. Now, if patients are going an average of five times a year, I hope they're not healthy patients. Maybe these are diabetic patients or something else that need more frequent follow-up. Um, so to validate his statement, he has obtained a random sample somehow of 10 of his patients and determined, counted how many office visits they had that year. If we look at that list, eyeball test, is the average five or is it more or is it less? He's thinking more. Do you think he's right? Think he's wrong? Is it more than five, less than five, or about five? Let's see what the evidence says. We want to know, do, do the data support his claim? Now notice in red, the, we are going to do a what kind of test? One tail or two tail? We want to know if he has seen the patients in the last year is, in red, different than five. One tail or two tail? two-tail test. He really thinks that it is more, but we're going to do a two-tail test to allow for both options, more or less, anyway, because we should be deciding that before we gather the data. Okay, so I'm going to do this in R because lazy, right? Okay, how can we enter a list of numbers into R? The C number will combine or concatenate them into a vector container. So I can put the C letter and then in parentheses list all those numbers with commas. And I'm going to save that as an X. And I can ask what is the length of X and it will tell me there's 10. Because I don't want to push buttons on a calculator, I can ask it to sum X and it will sum all the numbers in X. So the total is 76. If I divide that by 10, that's the same thing as doing the mean. The mean is 7.6. So in his sample of 10, the average is 7.6 visits a year. Is that higher than five? Yes, but is it statistically significantly higher than five? We need a z-score, or in this case, a t-score. Okay, so here, let's copy these numbers down. So. How would you write your null hypothesis? That should be the first thing you should do. How do you write your null hypothesis? It's the same way for a t-test and a z-test. We always state it about the population, and here we're talking in terms of the average. 
So what symbol do we use for the population average? Mu. Mu. And our hypothesized value, our nothing going on hypothesis, is that mu is equal to five. How would we write our two-tailed alternative hypothesis? H1 is not equal to five. Not e mu is not equal to five. Now, because we don't have anything better to go on, let's do alpha equals 0.05 and two tails. Would we want to do a two tailed here, even though he already stated that he thought it was going to be higher? To be conservative, let's do. Okay. So to make our T score, what goes on top of the fraction? Our observed average minus our hypothesized average. According to R, what's our observed average? 7.6. 7.6, and our hypothesized value is 5. And now we need to divide by the standard error. How do we get standard error? Standard deviation from our sample divided by square root of n. What was the standard deviation that R told us? 4.25. Okay, let me give you a little hint for the homework. And I put this in, well, I haven't made five and six I gotta make tonight. But for the homework, always use four decimal places for numbers while you're working on the work and then round your final answer. If you round like the standard deviation off and something else off, you'll get rounding error compounding. So let's use four decimal places in our work. Okay, but wait though, is that SDX biased or unbiased? It does um, unbiased. So it's, it's, uh, it is dividing by N minus one then on that one. Yeah. So we would, but, we're not going to divide by the standard deviation alone. We're going to have to take the standard deviation and divide it by the square root, square root of sample size. Woo. Now notice how I'm using four decimal places while I'm doing my work, even though my final answer, I'm going to cut it off at two decimal places. Will you hold it up just one more time quickly? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Dr. Schwartz, thanks for yeah. this class. I'm gonna jump out now. Okay. Thank you. Oh, we are out of time. Holy carvoli, we're having too much fun. Okay. So um, yeah, well, we better stop. Man, I love this class. <laughs> okay. Um, we are nearly done. This one goes really, really fast. I will record the last few minutes of these slides as soon as we hang up. I'll start this class recording uploading to YouTube. I'll record the last little bit. Um, go ahead and skim the chapters, make your discussion posts. Tonight I will be making the Canvas assignment so you can work on that over the weekend. So Monday when we come back, we can answer any questions you have on the homework. We are going to have office hours tomorrow, 7 to 8, and you can always email me in the meantime, okay? All right, we'll see you Thank guys. You. Take that test if it's not done yet. Hey, Sarah? Yeah. 